Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-Centered Leader in Confessional Broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. Welcome to Concord Matters. This week I am your host, Pastor Joshua Shear, coming to you from Cheyenne, Wyoming, where I am the senior pastor of our Savior Lutheran Church. You are listening to Concord Matters. We are a program of KFUO AM Radio, uh, Messenger of the Good News. We bring you each week, we bring you programming, uh, especially this Concord Matters show that is centered around our Lutheran beliefs and our practices and our confessions. So, uh, happy to be with you this week. I have two guests, one of which is one of my regular guests, uh, Pastor Mike Grevy of Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Golden, Illinois. Uh, Pastor Grevy, are you with us? I am here, Pastor Shear. Good to be with you again today. Awesome. Glad to have you. And then I also believe, I think, uh, our next pastor is a first-time guest, uh, Pastor Michael Kearney out of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alden, Iowa. Pastor Kearney, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good to be here. All right. Awesome. Well, that's good. So we are using the Book of Concord. The uh, best way to find it is to go to cph.org and order a Concordia Reader's Edition. Follow along there. That's the one we use for the program. The way the program works, we just kind of go through the texts and uh, discuss them. And we've been kind of in a while now. We've been going through the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, that is the defense of the Augsburg Confession, uh, that we confess the Augsburg Confession June 25th, 1530. The Lutheran princes do. Uh, the Roman Catholic theologians grab hold of it and try to publish a confutation. They, they object to things in it. And then, of course, uh, they grab onto that, and then Philip Melanchthon takes their work, which they did not provide to him in writing, but they had to use notes and so forth that were used at first. And he comes up with the apology, that is the defense of the Augsburg Confession, where he takes apart the arguments of the Roman Catholics over and over again. And so we've been going through that, and we are finally in Article 12, and they divide it up into 12A and B and so forth. So we're in 12A on repentance, and we left off last week, Pastor Hendrickson left off with uh, paragraph 65. So we're going to pick up on paragraph 66 this week. All right, let's get right into it then. I'll read paragraph 66 and 67, and we'll start discussing this. Our adversaries cry out that they are the church, that they are following the general agreement of the church. But Peter also cites here in our issue the consensus of the church. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins. This general agreement of the prophets is certainly to be judged as the general agreement of the church universal. We admit neither to the Pope nor to the Church the power to make decrees against this general agreement of the prophets. But the bull of Leo openly condemns this article, repentance, and the adversaries condemn it in the confutation. It is clear what sort of a Church we must judge these men to be. By their decrees they not only condemn the doctrine that we obtain the forgiveness of sins through faith, not on account of our works but because of Christ but they also give the command to abolish it by force and the sword and by every kind of cruelty to put to death good people who believe this way. All right, so we've got a bunch of stuff in here. Uh, the irony is not lost that, of course, in confronting the Roman Catholic Church, uh, Melanchthon uh, quotes Peter, so that's uh, uh, their, their first pope, so to speak, and he d goes after them. Pastor Grevy, you want to set this up just a little bit? I mean, this is whole. This whole section is about forgiveness being received by faith. So once again, we're back to justification. Did, would you just briefly set us up with this? Certainly, yes. The justification uh, is the teaching that we are freely uh, justified by the grace of God through, and then justifying faith is that that faith that grabs hold of the promises of God, uh, namely. Uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for all sins. And so uh, justification really is the, the central doctrine, uh, the, the, the heart of Christian doctrine upon which the Church does uh, stand or fall. And part and parcel to that 
is uh, the doctrine of repentance, then, which also fits very uh, well into this, because repentance, uh, the, uh, the Lutheran confessors teach us that repentance is both contrition, which is sorrow over sinning against God, mixed with faith, namely trust that God uh, died for, for that sin or those sins and for all sins on the cross. His son, Jesus, died for all of them. And that um, it, is, it is these two things together, contrition and faith, that make up repentance. And uh, that's uh, separated and apart from the works of the law, therefore. The works of the law uh, are not, properly speaking, part of repentance. Um, Christ's works, uh, in fulfilling the law perfectly on our behalf, uh, is what justification is the heart of justification of the sinner. Yeah, excellent. Pastor Kearney, uh, he goes right here to Acts chapter 10, which if I remember is, is Peter speaking to the household of Cornelius, who's, who's, a, uh, who's a, actually a, a Gentile, um, who's not a Jew. Um, and they go there, uh, but they're going there in the face of this claim that the Roman Catholics are the church because they're following the general agreement of the church, and the, the following paragraphs are going to really deal with that. But how, how do we determine church? How, how do we determine what's church? Who's the church? Well, the, the definition that we give in the Confessions is that the church is the gathering of the saints around the Word of God. And so uh, the Church is not defined by genealogy, as, as the Jews uh, thought, it, thought it to be, uh, nor, nor is it defined by the hierarchy, as the Roman Catholic Church would teach. Uh, it, it's defined by the Word of God, the, the, the proclamation of Christ and the Gospel. And so, uh, so when, we, when we speak of the Church, we are speaking of those who are gathered around the Word of God to, to receive, receive the Word of God from Christ, uh, which, which is the Gospel. Yeah, and, and, and of course, like I said, the irony of this, of course, is that the, the Roman Catholics had found everything on the primacy of Peter, and that, that is the basis of the, the papacy, uh, being the height of that organization and order to be the church. And yet here we're, we're citing actually Peter, uh, speaking of, of salvation and, and so forth, forgiveness coming only by believing, by faith. And so this is, this is kind of the, the, the humorous side of this is that they're, they're using uh, the primacy of Pope or of Peter against the Roman Catholics themselves this way. But you're absolutely right. The, the Church is where the Word is, and, and especially the, the Word taught rightly, uh, the pure gospel. Um, so then we get into this. Uh, the general agreement of the prophets is certainly to be judged as the general agreement of the Church universal. Um, yeah, this is this is prophets and apostles, which is what we base this, uh, when we talk about the Scriptures. You talk about the prophetic and apostolic Scriptures, um, now, then they say we admit neither the Pope nor the Church uh, can make decrees against this general agreement. I mean, Pastor Grevy, this this is one of the fundamental differences between Lutherans and Roman Catholics, correct? Absolutely. Uh, when we talk about uh, the testimony of the Church, the heart of that testimony uh, is, are the prophets and the apostles. That that is the heart of the testimony of the Church. Uh, that's where it begins, and that's where it, that's the foundation of it. So the testimony of the Church um, is not established and founded uh, on the papacy, uh, and it doesn't stand on that. It stands on the testimony of the prophets and the apostles. That's the consensus. That's where consensus comes from. That's where this general agreement of the Church Universal comes from, of which the confessors are speaking here in this, in paragraph 66. So um, that, that's why uh, that's why it's great that the confessors cite Peter here uh, when he says in Acts 10 that to him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. That's uh, uh, simple and profound and straightforward and to the precise point. Uh, of exactly what we're talking about here, that if you want to talk about a testimony, uh, let's look first to the prophets and the apostles uh, of Jesus Christ, because to them uh, it was given to, to speak his word, and, uh, and that word is the word that gives the Holy Spirit. Excellent. Also not lost here is the idea that, you know, this is a sermon uh, recorded by the Holy Spirit of, of the Apostle Peter, in which Peter is actually teaching doctrine, 
And, and of course, there's a lesson for anyone who wants to write a sermon, is that, that sermons can be doctrinal. They, they can teach what the scriptures teach. And, uh, of course, they're the chief thing being the, the salvation that is by faith in Christ alone. Uh, Pastor Kearney, um, it goes on to talk about this bull of Leo. It, is that talking about the, the excommunication of Luther? Yes, that is. And, in fact, the, the Constitution uh, cites this as the primary reason that they must condemn this doctrine uh, of the Lutherans. And so uh, I'll quote it here. It says, For this reason, Pope Leo X, this is the Constitution of Rome, Pope Leo X of blessed memory condemned this in the teaching of Luther, and then he quotes Luther here, that there are three parts to penance, namely contrition, confession, and satisfaction, is found neither in the Holy Scriptures nor in the writings of the Holy Christian doctors. They say, hence, this part of the article cannot be admitted under any circumstances. Their, their primary reason for uh, citing that they cannot accept this, this doctrine is the papal bull uh, of, of Leo against Luther. Uh, they, 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 it, it seems, as you read the computation, they're scrambling to try and come up with some scriptural warrant for their, their condemnation of it. Uh, but you can see by the, by the testimony there that they're, the real reason is that the Pope said that this is wrong. Which is, in the end, the final governing authority in, in the Roman Catholic Church. Not necessarily Scripture, not even what, you know, what Church Fathers had said, but really what the Pope says right now. Right. The, the understanding is that the, the Bible of, of the Roman Catholic Church is the understanding that the, is the Bible is uh, unclear and, and is not uh, self, uh, self-revealing uh, and, and must must have that human voice uh, that, that they, they say is instituted there by God of the Pope, and that no one else has the authority to speak uh, definitively on Scripture, uh, which, which, of course, we reject, uh, and we believe that the Bible is itself clear. Yeah, that's, that's a debated issue nowadays in our postmodern world where everyone takes Pilate's view of what is truth. Um, but, he, but you're absolutely right. We, we do confess that Scriptures are clear, and, and that's what we run with is is the clarity that that uh, you know these things do not need this the, uh, just a rabbit trail here with that this sounds a lot like I mean y- you talk to like different cults and so forth where they have prophets and they have prophetesses and they have these uber spiritual people who get these new revelations from God this sounds very similar to that isn't it it's remarkably similar to Mormonism when you look at it that uh, Mormonism has the prophet who speaks uh, from as the mouthpiece of God, and uh, and of course they even have a, a book that's called Another Testimony, uh, which which Scripture clearly denies would ever happen, uh, and and so you have this uh, this changing doctrine that happens in uh, in Mormonism uh, that's whatever the current prophet says that's that's the law, and uh, Roman Catholics are a little more careful to uh, to shade it in a different way because. It's, their uh, emphasis is on tradition, and so uh, popes are not really in the habit of drastically changing doctrine overnight, uh, but you can see some of the philosophical word games that happen uh, that, that change, change what was taught by Augustine, for example, to, uh, to a modern, modern Roman Catholic theologian. Yeah, exactly. And of course, lest, lest we think that this is just only outside of our own, our own walls, uh, this, this temptation to have little popes uh, to have this kind of ongoing revelation and, and ongoing change in authority or change in meaning or, or things is, is, is also within our own walls as Lutherans. Um, this happens whenever we, we look outside of Scripture for, for uh, an authority, whether it's a commission or, or something like that we look to for a final answer on things. Uh, or even or even if we look to, you know, uh, church, uh, church leaders, uh, presidents and so forth, that, that, no, the scriptures really need to rule in these things, and that, and that is the Lutheran position. And it's, it's sometimes easier just to look at those authority figures, like a, like a CTCR or a CCM or something like that, and, uh, and just to kind of go with what they say. But really, in the end, as Lutherans, we need to go back to scripture and show it clearly from there, because Scripture is going to clearly teach it if it is a teaching of Scripture. And so this is what we must strive to do, and we fight against that kind of instinct to just kind of go and appeal to some other human authority. Um, and, and so we need to do that as well. And it's always a good reminder for us as Lutherans to do that. All right, so let's move on. We'll go on to paragraph 68 through 69 here. 
They have famous authors, Scotus, Gabriel Beale, and the like, and passages of the fathers that are quoted in a butchered form in the decrees. Certainly, if the quotations are to be counted, they win. For there is very great crowd of most silly writers on the sentences. As though they had worked together, they defend these fables about the merit of attrition and of works and of other things that we have mentioned previously. But let no one be moved by the multitude of citations. There's no great weight in the testimonies of the later writers. They did not create their own writings, but only by compiling from the writers before them transferred these opinions from some books into others. They have exercised no judgment. Just like petty judges, they have silently approved the errors of their superiors, which they have not understood. Therefore, let us not hesitate to use this saying of Peter, which summarizes the prophets and opposes ever so many legions of the commentators on the sentences. All right. So there we went a little bit further than what I suggested, but there we are. So, um, here you have, guys, uh, Pastor Grevy, what about this? I mean, the, what kind of things are the, the Roman Catholics going for here? They're, they're going for fame. They have famous people doing this. They have... Um, multitude they have so many and then of course he says here they're quoted in a butchered form what kind of what kind of authority is this well this is really only the authority of man and it's uh what we might refer to as um what what peeper francis peeper calls the uh, magisterial use of reason as an example so in other words it's reason exalting itself to a position higher than that of Scripture, and uh, that always fails. There's never it's never successful in the end, and so uh, regardless of how many people get on board with it uh, and how much of a great crowd uh, they have, uh, still in the end uh, it comes to nothing and it's brought to nothing. Um, so the confessors are encouraging us here to not be moved by the multitude of the citations. Um, their testimonies don't, the, the weight of their testimonies doesn't really hold water. And so in the end, they end up drying up and uh, coming to nothing. Uh, so again, we're brought back to the scriptures. We're brought back to the testimony of the prophets and the apostles over and against the testimony uh, of these men, uh, however great they may have uh, been in the eyes of other men. So, Pastor Kearney, does this happen for us as Lutherans then? I mean, you want to talk about famous. I mean, we're, we're named for Martin Luther. Um, does this happen for us, that where we, where we might have to take something of Luther's that he said or he wrote and, and say, listen, no, you know, Scripture Scripture's not, not really in line with that, so we can't, we can't subscribe to that. Oh, absolutely. This is one of the, uh, the critiques that, uh, that uh, Roman Catholics and, and others, uh, non-denominational, all sorts of churches, will will accuse Lutherans of, of, of following Martin Luther as our pope, as if, as if whatever Martin Luther says is therefore inspired. Um, we, are, we are not followers of Martin Luther. We are followers of the confession of Martin Luther, which is the confession of Scripture. And so, uh, insofar as Luther uh, confesses clearly with the Scriptures, which by and large he does, uh, we would agree with him. But we are not bound to uh, to confess everything that he confessed, uh, especially if there's something he... I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but uh, if, if, if Luther were to say something that is outlandishly against the Scriptures, of course we would say, well, my, my conscience is not bound to Martin Luther, it is bound to the Scriptures. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, like, early on in his life, Luther hasn't jettisoned the idea of purgatory yet. I mean, yeah, that's a good example, yeah. That, that's just one example. We we wouldn't canonize his view of purgatory because it doesn't agree with the canon of Scripture. So um, I think it's always a good good reminder to remind us, and, and you know, as, as members of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, uh, we we subscribe to the to the scriptures, the prophetic and apostolic scriptures, and then we also subscribe to the fifteen eighty book of Concord, uh, the kind of stuff we're reading here in the Concordia Readers Edition. This is what makes a Lutheran. This is what defines what Lutherans believe. This is what informs what Lutherans do. Uh, so this is yes, Luther is referenced. He's an author of several of the pieces in the book of Concord. He's referenced several times as a as the chief teacher of the Lutheran Church in the Book of Concord. So we, we, we pay all attention to that we can. But again, as you said, Pastor Kearney, 
Scripture dictates what of Luther's we accept versus what we would would maybe reject or ignore or whatever it would be. So this is always a a good good reminder even for us. Um, and 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 Pastor Grieve, you did a great job of reminding us. You know, the weight of the testimonies is of course found in the weight of Scripture, not in the multitude of of, of people, not in their fame, uh, any of that stuff. It's all that's all extra. So let's let's move on here. We we, we ended with paragraph seventy. And let's go through 71 through 73. So we just got done talking about Peter's uh, preaching. And in paragraph 71, it picks up after that. The Holy Spirit's testimony is added to this statement of Peter. For the text speaks in this way. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Therefore, let godly consciences know that, God, what, that God's command is this. They are to believe that they are freely forgiven for Christ's sake and not for the sake of our works. Let them sustain themselves against despair and against the terrors of sin and of death by this command of God. Let them know that this belief has existed among saints from the beginning of the world. For Peter clearly cites the general agreement of the prophets and the writings of the apostles confirm that they believe the same thing. Nor are testimonies of the fathers lacking. For Bernard says the same thing in the words that are in no way hidden. It is necessary, first of all, to believe that you cannot have forgiveness of sins except by the indulgence of God, but add yet that you believe also this, namely, that through him sins are forgiven to you. This is the testimony that the Holy Spirit asserts in your heart, saying your sins are forgiven you. For so the Apostle concludes that a person is justified freely through faith. All right. So here you have the response. So not only are we going to cite Peter in the face of the Roman Catholic kind of insistence about, uh, you know, Peter's supremacy and the Pope's supremacy, but now we're going to add the fact, of course, that <clears throat> the triune God himself, the Holy Spirit, adds his testimony, of course, by granting faith uh, coming upon Cornelius and his whole household there in Acts chapter 10. Uh, so, so Pastor Grievey, uh in this section, you know, you see Peter and the Holy Spirit used, and then you see you know God's command, and that this command of God does stuff. But then you have this wonderful thing. It says, you know, uh, let them know that this belief has existed among saints from the beginning of the world. We only have like a minute or two. If you could just take a brief moment and introduce the idea of of Lutheran Church is actually the Catholic Church versus the Roman Catholic Church. Right, Catholic, yes, meaning uh, meaning universal or of the whole. So, in other words, uh, when we st- when we speak about Catholicity, we speak about that which has been uh, believed, taught, and confessed really from the time of the apostles of Jesus Christ. That's what we that's what we're talking about when we say Catholic. So, we are talking about the continuity of the Church uh, of all times and all ages. Uh, where saints have existed in the Christian Church uh, from from this time, really, uh, from the Book of Acts, really, uh, that we're looking at here onward, and that's really what we're talking about. And of course, we wouldn't, um, we would actually say too. Uh, of course, we would include uh, the Old Testament Church as well. We're not. Uh, this is just you know referring here to the Book of Acts, but the point is that anybody who has trusted the promise of the Lord's Word uh, throughout the history of God's creation is really part of the Church Catholic. And they're really in... Exactly. Uh, they, yeah, they're in, the, uh, they're in um, the realm of salvation, and they are saved by grace through faith in Christ. And in that promise, uh, the promise of the seed of the woman uh, goes all the way back to the Garden. Yeah, in fact, you know, Genesis 12, Abraham is righteous by faith. Uh, that that is how he's righteous. That's before he does any works of obedience. He's already righteous because he believes in God. Right. And he's counted to him as right. righteousness. All right, so we're going to pick up this discussion a little bit after the break, but we're coming up on a break here on Concord Matters on KFU AM radio. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll have that little break, and we'll be back to discuss a little bit more about how the, the Scriptures and the Fathers and how the Lutheran Church is actually truly the Catholic Church. Uh, not Roman Catholic, but Catholic. You're listening to Concord Matters here on KFUO AM Radio, the messenger of the good news. We'll be right back after a short break.
Concordia University, Wisconsin, and Mequon overlooks a half mile of beautiful Lake Michigan shoreline. CUW campus is located 15 miles north of Milwaukee, with over 70 undergraduate majors, 28 graduate degree programs, and doctorate programs in pharmacy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and nursing practice. CUW offers online learning and accelerated learning at one of nine Wisconsin centers and one in St. Louis. Traditional or accelerated education, CUW has the program for you. CUW.edu. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. Each weekday, the servants of God at the LCMS International Center gather together to receive the gifts of God in His Word. I invite you to join us weekdays, 10 a.m., for a live broadcast of daily chapel services on KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Hi, this is Pastor Stan Stanley inviting you to join Christian Friends of New Americans on Saturday, April 28th at Concordia Seminary for our Freedom 5K Run and Walk. The cost is $30 per person. Seminary students and some families are free. If you're not able to participate, you can support a refugee child. Do it for fun and do it to help refugees and immigrants learn about Jesus. For more information or to register, cfna-stl.org slash walk. Proverbs 27, 17 tells us, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. That's why weekday mornings at 8 a.m., two Missouri Synod pastors test their mettle against the Holy Scriptures, certain that not only will they come out better for it, but so will you. The sword of the Spirit is sharp to the touch, but you need practice wielding it. Check out Sharper Iron, 8 a.m., every weekday on Worldwide KFUO. Miriam, Leah, Esther, Rachel. Did you know there are over 700 women mentioned in the Bible and that over 100 of those are named? According to one author, over 75 women in the Protestant Bible speak, with the Shulamite woman from Song of Solomon, Naomi, and Hannah included on the list of 10 women who speak the most in the Bible, and Jesus' longest conversation described in the Gospels with a woman at the well. Many of the Bible's women could be considered heroes. Moses' sister Miriam, Rahab, a spy who helped the Israelites conquer Jericho, the young widow Ruth, who was devoted to her mother-in-law, Esther, a Jewish queen who prevented the extermination of her people, and Jesus' mother, Luke 128 described as the one the angels greeted, saying, You who are highly favored. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Welcome back to Concord Matters. Having a few little technical glitches here again today, apparently. All right. Check the settings here. All right. Well, I am not hearing my guests or the show. So uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. All right. Okay, Excellent. Good. I'm here. Too. All right. Can you hear me? You're there, there, too. All right. Sounds good. I'm just not hearing myself. That's okay. I can hear myself when I talk. <laughs> So, sounds good. All right, so we left off before the break talking about uh, the Catholic. That We were talking, apology of the Augsburg Confession. We were in paragraph 73, article 12a on repentance. And we were talking about how that, that this belief that, that forgiveness has been received by faith is not only prevalent, of course, in Acts chapter 10 in Peter's preaching. It's confirmed in Acts chapter 10 by the Holy Spirit giving, coming to Cornelius and his household. But then also it adds in there about how uh, this has been existed since the beginning of the world. And we kind of talked a little bit about that. Pastor Grevy talked about, uh, you know, how promised the seed. Abraham is counted as righteous before. So from the very beginning, this has been the way of salvation, the way of forgiveness. And, and so we got to this, and I'm thinking, uh, whether you're on the one year or the three year, uh, you had a chance to, to hear the Good Shepherd lessons in the last couple Sundays. Uh, so, so Pastor Kearney, could you talk a little bit about the, the Good Shepherd narrative, how this might relate to this? Yes, so, so, uh, every, every week, 
whether you are, are confessing the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or even the Athanasian Creed, we have this, uh, this confession of faith that we believe in the one holy uh, Christian, or if you're an old TLH guy, uh, Catholic faith, right? The, the one holy Christ, Christian or Catholic and apostolic faith. Uh, that uh, when, when we say that, we're not, uh, we're not saying that, uh, that the, the Lutheran Church is the, uh, is the only church that has ever, ever had this faith. Uh, we are saying that the Lutheran Church is is properly connected to that one faith that goes all the way back to the beginning of time with with the uh, with the seed of, of Adam uh, or, or with the seed of Eve rather the, the con- uh, promise of that seed and so we have in Ephesians four it says uh, that uh, there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call one Lord one faith one baptism one God and Father of all who is over all and through all. And so when we, when we speak of being Catholic, that's really what we're talking about there, is that we, are, we belong to the one Christian Church uh, on earth that, that, that is connected to the saints in heaven. And then Jesus yeah. clarifies this with, for us with the, uh, the Good Shepherd uh, narrative here, where he, he, he says, I am the Good Shepherd, and uh, the sheep hear my voice, and, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and his sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Uh, we we are not unified by uh, by human institution uh, or or by any structure of the church or of any kind of uh, councils or, or synods that we, we come up with. We are unified by listening to the voice of our one shepherd, and, and by listening to to him uh, through the voice of scripture. We we do uh, we are grafted into that one vine. To use another another example there. Uh, we are grafting the one vine of Christ, which gives us that Catholic uh, standing that uh, is not dependent on who happens to be the elected official of our church body at every, any, any given time, but is de- dependent entirely upon the common confession of the faith uh, derived from Scripture, which never changes. Yeah, and this this is the constant temptation we have uh, as, as, as sinful human beings, though. We, we're always, we, we think that Christ's voice isn't enough. And so we need to have another another kind of authority. And so, I just heard it recently put that you know everybody wants a pope, and uh, and of course that's uh, that's just it's true. But of course it's it's bad. <laughs> it's not good for you that uh, that you would want this other outside of Scripture, outside of Christ's teachings, kind of voice to tell you what to believe and what to do. Um, so well, that's. Uh, and this is also yeah. important for us to note. Uh, one of the common complaints against Lutherans from Catholics. Um, I, I, I was, I, uh, I'm a former Catholic, and so I, I know these complaints quite well, <laughs> as I said them myself at times, uh, that the, uh, the complaint that Catholics will say is, well, you've given up your, the, the Pope in Rome to make yourself the Pope. And there is where we can, we can take that uh, uh, as, as a healthier reminder that uh, our, our own reason isn't supreme even. Not, not, not what I think Scripture says, but what Scripture actually says. So this is where the clarity uh, of Scripture is so foundational to the Lutheran Church that uh, that we we must confess this and and defend it uh, every core of our being uh, because it is we we do not have the Pope of ourselves we have not given up the Pope in Rome for our own uh, papish uh, in a way, ways but uh, rather that, uh, that that the Scriptures themselves speak clearly and uh, and we are governed by the One Shepherd and not by our own reason. Yeah, and this this comes into play really well um, when you're talking about uh, issues like you know uh, recently the the whole idea of the various Greek texts of the New Testament and so forth and how uh, you know we we try to select of those and then and then there was recently another issue about you know science and and religion and how they interact and in particular you know how do, how do we confront kind of evolutionary things do we engage in these discussions do we modify our own kind of stances and beliefs do we change the words we use in order to make sure that you know we don't appear like you know uh, numbskulls in front of the scientific community um, all the, all these strange strange things. Uh, that that just are no the voice of the shepherds there the word of God is clear on these things, uh, but of course to to uh, to kind of push the push the envelope a little bit further people of course one of the first things you have to take out is actually the clarity of Scripture in order to kind of invent uh, human opinions and start inserting them into into the faith and and so that's uh, it's it's an ongoing temptation of of humans and and of men 
and that this is what will happen as we go on through time. So, all right, uh, we get to this quote of Bernard. Um, Pastor Grevy, what do you got to say about Bernard? This is uh, Bernard of Clairvaux uh, from the 12th century. He, um, a Christian, he, he was um, born in Europe. He was a native of France. And um, he is remembered for um, his preaching as well as uh, hymn composition. A couple of hymn texts that our listeners might be familiar with is, uh, O Jesus, King Most Wonderful, and uh, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Uh, that's part of the heritage of the faith left by St. Bernard. And so what the confessors do here, I think, is, is beautiful, because in contrast to uh, the previous names that were mentioned, such as Scotus and Gabriel Beale and so forth, they take uh, Bernard of Clairvaux and uh, as one of the, the, the Church Fathers, and they quote him as adding to the testimony, uh, because Bernard gives a faithful testimony. Uh, he points to the Holy Spirit asserting in, in one's heart that your sins are forgiven you, and that this is actually, uh, as, uh, as Bernard of Clairvaux uses, and I can't help but think that this is a little bit of a, uh, that this is a, a bit of a poke uh, at uh, what came to be one of the abominations in the Roman Catholic Church, namely the indulgences, he says that it is necessary, first of all, to believe that you cannot have forgiveness of sins except by the indulgence of God. Uh, so he takes that word and uses it of God and says it is, it, it, that it is God is the one who forgives your sins uh, by the Holy Spirit. And so the confessors um, do a great job of citing a, a faithful testimony of a man, uh, which we can and we do, uh, when and where we can. And so we certainly add that to the list of faithful testimonies of those who have come after the uh, prophets and the apostles. Yeah, and in fact, you kind of see that Lutheran progression in how they speak about it. They start with prophets, and then they say the apostles confirm what the prophets said, and then they move into the fathers, and they cite a father that says what the pro apostles and prophets said. Right. Um, yeah. and, and it's kind of different than the way the Roman Catholic theologians work, because, they, of course, they start at, you know, their, their theologians in the present, Pope Leo's bull, so forth. They move on to recent medieval theologians and their opinions from Peter Lombard's sentences and so forth. It, it, it's almost kind of a reverse. Like, you know, when you have a continuing yeah. revelation doctrine, which is what really the, the, the doctrine is for the Roman Catholic Church, um, that you know, new things can come up. That they they have new teachings. That you kind of almost have to go backwards. And then, of course, how do you use your scriptures? Then is you're using the scriptures to prove the fathers, rather than using the fathers to prove the scriptures. And, right. and that is a right. that's a huge difference in in how how history, church <clears throat> history, is used uh, in relation to scripture. And uh, a good reminder of of the Lutheran practice, which is you you start at scripture, and then you give the faithful witnesses to scripture from history, rather than you start at uh, theologians that agree with you, and then you find your way back into the scriptures and hunt and peck for things that you think will mean to support you. So Right, and that's the very thing that the, that the, the scripture does. I can't uh, cite the chapter and the verse at the moment, but it speaks about um, uh, the prophets and apostles uh, being the foundation, but Christ is the, Christ is the cornerstone. Uh, he's the one upon whom the, prof the pro prophets and apostles built on, uh, and so that's the that's that's as it goes, right? You start with your point of departure uh, needs to be Christ, and then you move out from there, right? Yeah, that's that's Ephesians two that uh, the prophets right. and the apostles are the yeah. foundation, and, and Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, the cornerstone the builders rejected, so to speak. If you want to go back to the Psalms, uh, so so yeah, uh, this is wonderful. All right, so so we get paragraph 74, and we'll read that. Uh, it's just kind of a wrap-up of Bernard, but we'll read that through 76, and we'll keep on this discussion. These words of Bernard shed a wonderful light upon our cause, because he not only requires that we believe in a general way that sins are pardoned through mercy, but he also asks us to add special faith by which we believe that our sins are forgiven. He teaches how we can be sure about the forgiveness of sins, namely, when our hearts are encouraged through faith and become peaceful through the Holy Spirit. What more do the adversaries require? 
Do they still dare deny that we receive the forgiveness of sins through faith, or that faith is part of repentance? Third, the adversaries say that sin is pardoned because an attrite or contrite person brings forth an act of love to God, and by this act deserves the forgiveness of sins. This is nothing but teaching the law, the gospel being blotted out, and the promise about Christ being abolished. For they require only the law, and our works because the law demands love. Besides, they teach us to be confident that we obtain forgiveness of sins because of contrition and love. What else is this than to put confidence in our works, not in God's word and promise about Christ? But if the law is enough for receiving the forgiveness of sins, what need is there of the gospel? What need is there of Christ if we receive forgiveness of sins because of our own work? We, on the other hand, call consciences away from the law to the gospel, and from confidence in their own works to confidence in the promise in Christ. We do so because the gospel presents Christ to us and freely promises the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake. In this promise it asks us to trust, namely, that we are reconciled to the Father for Christ's sake, not for the sake of our own contrition or love. For there is no other mediator or atoning sacrifice than Christ. Neither can we do the works of the law unless we have first been reconciled through Christ. If we would do anything, we must believe that for Christ's sake, as mediator and atoning sacrifice, we receive the forgiveness of sins, and not for the sake of these works. All right, so there we, we get into the actual crux of the matter as far as uh, the real issue with, with repentance that is had here. The Lutherans confess repentance as, as we started out, uh, Pastor Grevy, you did a great introduction of this, that this justification, this forgiveness of sins comes by the gospel and not by the law. So, so Pastor Kearney, uh, you know, since you have a background, Roman Catholic uh, background, What's this attrite or contrite? We've had this in shows previous, but just as a brief little re reminder for folks about attrition versus contrition, things like that. Yeah, so uh, the, the Roman Catholic theologians will make a distinction between contrition, uh, which, which modern, modern Catholics will call uh, perfect contrition, uh, and uh, they make a distinction between that and what they call imperfect contrition, which uh, the, the time of the Confessions was, was called uh, attrition. Uh, now, now, the difference between those two, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read from the modern Catholic Catechism to clarify this. Uh, when it arises from a love by, by which God is loved above all else, contrition is called perfect. Such contrition remits venial sins. It also attains confession, er, for, forgiveness of mortal sins if it includes the firm resolution to have recourse to sacramental confession as soon as possible. So they would say that contrition itself is the cause of forgiveness that that uh, the the um, the person who is is truly sorry for their sins out of love for God that 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 uh, causes causes their, their forgiveness and then they would say that uh, uh, attrition uh, is is uh, it, it, let's see it is it is born of the consideration of sin's ugliness or the fear of eternal damnation and the other penalties threatening the sinner. Such a stirring of conscience can initiate an interior process, which under the prompting of grace will be brought to completion by sacramental absolution. So they would say that, well, contrition itself, the work of, of the sinner who feels sorry out of a love for God, that itself merits forgiveness. But attrition is merely recognizing that I have sinned and I deserve penalty, uh, the penalty for my sin, and out of fear I am sorry for my sin. And uh, because of that, uh, I, I need to have uh, something added to it, and it's not enough. And so where, where Lutherans would say, yeah, but in the moment where you are terrified for your, for your sin and, and feel uh, awful for what you have done, uh, how can you really make a distinction between contrition and attrition? Mm. How do I know that this, uh, this sorrow for my sins is derived from the love of Christ, or if it's just the fear of, of uh, having sinned against God? Uh, the, the terrified conscience really has has no way to know the difference there, which is why Lutherans would make this distinction and say contrition and, uh, and, and faith is, is, what, uh, is, is what repentance is properly, and that uh, both of these are a gift from God, and, and it's the, uh, it's, it's the out, outside Word of God that grants us forgiveness, not our actions that, that merit it. Yeah, and so it, very as good. it says here in, in, 75, that, uh, in, in paragraph 75 in the Oxford Confession, uh, that, that to teach this way, that, that attrition or contrition 
brings forth an act of love, uh, that, that this act deserves the forgiveness of sin. This is nothing but teaching the law. There's no gospel there. It's if you really, uh, if you are really sorry for the right reason, then that merits forgiveness, rather than recognizing the work of God terrifying us and the work of God uh, granting us forgiveness. That sounds that sounds very familiar for those who would maybe stress, you know, uh, the forgiveness based upon the sincerity of of what uh, what you're confessing. Uh, you know, I know that old Pietism would do something like that. Do you, do you really mean yeah. it, or, or kind of the revivalistic mm-hmm. religions of America, where everything's hinged upon your sincerity of your, uh, you know, confession of sins uh, that you really felt bad about what you had done, and that's but, how you and, can and know you're is, forgiven. This is the natural religion that all man. All mankind has that uh, if, if I do the right things or if I uh, act the right way, then I can be forgiven based on what I have done. The gospel is yeah. entirely foreign to the natural man. The idea that God would give me forgiveness free of charge is just unheard of, and, and so yeah. that's why there, there really is only two religions in the world: the religion of the law and the religion of the gospel. Yeah, exactly. Now, there's there's a section in the small code articles I think where where Luther's talking about this, and he actually talks about uh, how contrition was first the means in which you know you kind of earned your forgiveness, and then because not many people could actually be convinced that they were contrite, then they came up with attrition, uh, and then even because that wasn't enough at times, then they kind of came up with the idea that well, you you had the intent to be sorry for for your sins, uh, <laughs> and that right, that might right. be enough. Uh, but this is this is exactly what happens. However, uh, you know, you talk to a lawyer about contracts and so forth. You know, there are there are a million ways to try to weave and duck around terms of a contract and and things like that. And of course, that's what happens when the religion of the law is. You know, you can set the bar somewhere, and, and you know, we can wiggle the bar around a little bit lower and stuff if we need to as well. You know, to the point where you know, for dropping a coin in a cough or purchasing, you can get a full plenary indulgence in 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 fifteen you know early fifteen hundreds uh, Germany uh, to help fund the the building of St. Peter's and, and St. Paul's in in, in Rome. So it just you know, th- this legalistic religion becomes just this mess. Um, but of course, this is the beauty about this it, for us as we confess this, um, Pastor Grevy. What is this? I mean. It, what are they saying when, when, when a religion is founded upon the law, the teaching of the law, that you earn your salvation, you, you earn your afterlife by what you do? What is being done to the gospel and what's being done to Christ? And this is why, why Lutherans get, get, their, get their upset about this. Uh, what's going on? Well, it, it, yes, uh, when it's all about the law, then Christ is, is uh, being dishonored uh, for what he's done because... Uh, it is only because of his death and resurrection uh, that we have good news. And, and that good news is that we are justified freely by the grace of God uh, through uh, faith in Jesus Christ. So the problem with um, a religion entirely based on the works of the law is that the, it just blots out the gospel. It's just gone, and there's no comfort uh, there's no uh, clean conscience. There cannot be a clean conscience. Uh, one is always going to be wondering whether or not uh, he's sorry enough, or or how does he know if he's sorry enough? How does he know he's not sorry enough? And it just becomes a vicious circle that goes nowhere fast. Um, and so we don't. We certainly, um, uh, as Pastor Kearney uh, pointed out so well, we don't uh, disregard contrition. Uh, as part of repentance, uh, but it is not. But it does not merit the forgiveness of sins. Uh, that's the big thing. And uh, and this contrition is brought about by the Word of God, uh, which is where the Holy Spirit also does His work. And uh, then um, we trust uh, the Word also that says that uh, hey, um, Jesus died for that sin. And uh, that trust is that faith, then, that is added to the contrition. That's two parts. And this, that, that, these two must always be, really be kept together. They cannot be separated one from another. They're distinct, but they can't be pulled apart. Uh, because to pull them apart, then, um, you know, I suppose one would, could probably say that, uh, that faith without contrition could lead to, um, a, a, a too comfortable life, I suppose, one that one that would uh, 
almost be a licentiousness that one could say, well, you know, I've got faith so I can do whatever I want, uh, and I don't have to worry about the law. Uh, well, no, we still concern ourselves with the law because the law is also good, uh, but we don't build, uh, we cannot build uh, salvation on the law because to do so uh, brings uh, souls to ruin. So we have to bring in the gospel, and that's why we have to have uh, law and gospel, as Pastor Kearney also said. Yeah. Let's, let's just, I mean, just look at these two paragraphs here, the, these paragraphs about this. See the doctrines that are involved when you lose the gospel. You lose uh, the, the subjective things like the, the comfort and the conscience and so forth. Uh, but also, you learn these objective things. That are, are the gospel itself, uh, the promise about Christ is abolished, it says. How about, you know, when you get to you, Christ being the mediator, Christ being the atoning sacrifice. Right. That, that all of these are gone as soon as you've gone to a method of, you know, have I done enough? Have, have, have you know, and, and this can happen in many ways. Uh, as a pastor in a Lutheran church, I've seen it happen to people over whether or not they think they have enough faith or not. Mm -hmm. You know, that they start right. quantifying right. faith. And right. It's like, well, no, this is why we, of course, keep our our focus on the objective things, that is, God's word, God's word of promise that, you know, your sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. God's word of promise about, you know, uh, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. God's word of promise that, you know, you've been baptized, you've been given new birth of the Holy Spirit, renewal and re regeneration, and so forth. Baptism now saves you. Uh, words of promise about absolution, if your sins are forgiven on earth, they're forgiven in heaven. Words of promise about the Lord's Supper that, you know, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Uh, so this is why we kind of stress those objective things to kind of keep away from that internal, natural sense to kind of start figuring it out in ourselves. And and so it's 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 very helpful. Um, Pastor Kearney, do you have anything else you want to add? We're, we're starting to run out of time a little bit for the day. Uh, but do you have anything else you want to add about this idea and, and the damage that is done to Christ? Uh, and, and you have about a minute to do that. Sure. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, r real briefly, um, uh, this will come later in, in this uh, article. But uh, when uh, when we when we discuss satisfaction, uh, we as Lutherans we wouldn't say that there is no such thing as satisfaction for the Christian life, uh, but we would make the distinction that it is not uh, meritorious towards forgiveness. Um, but but I think the other thing that we could we could point out there is that. Uh, if, if I sin against, you know, I, I was thinking when, when you're talking about in, in the parish, if somebody feels uh, feels like they, they haven't done enough or, or have, have done enough of these things, part of that comes from in dealing with our neighbor. If I sin against my neighbor and as a Christian uh, and I repent, I want to, I, 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 as a, a result of that faith, I do want to make it up to him. Now, that's not always possible, uh, but, but that, that itself is not part of repentance proper. It's a result that's bearing fruit in keeping with repentance, and so uh, we, we have to make a distinction there. And, exactly. and if we don't make that distinction, then then we put all the emphasis on what I have done, and and you're left with uh, nothing to point to the to the stricken conscience when uh, when when they feel that guilt. Without uh, if the focus is on what I have done to make up for my sin, you're always going to have that question: Have I done enough? And the answer is always going to be no. You have not right. done enough. And that's uh, but, exactly it. As you you jump into questions about in and of yourself, have you done enough? You're always going to be in the law. Your always answer is going to be no. And yeah, of course, this is why the Lutheran Church is so strong to stress the gospel. That is Christ's work, Christ's promise. These gifts, which are for you and for your forgiveness, and and so forth. Uh, you've been listening to Concord Matters here on KFU AM Radio. Uh, we're coming to the end of our program today. We've been discussing the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. I want to pass, uh, thank both Pastor Grevy and Pastor Kearney uh, for contributing today to our discussion. And, uh, yeah, go to church this weekend. Hear the gospel. That's good for you. <laughs>